my, uh, my role here is an easy one. I'm here to welcome you all. I like the new diagonal. I don't know who thought of that, but everything's starting to spin now and be more dynamic. That's nice. Uh, and then I think the real introduction is gonna now come from Laya Selma. So thank you, Laya, for introducing. And let's give a round of applause. Thank you. I'm going to tell a short story to introduce Mireya. Barcelona, September 20, 2023. Each year around the fall equinox, thousands of European robins, Eritacus rubecula, migrate from cold northern European climates to southern warmer areas. European robins' eyes react to light and to the Earth's magnetic field to orient themselves on this long journey uh, of up to 2,000 miles. The recent, recently arrived European robin is comfortable among humans and loud environments. Upon her arrival, she's searching for branches to build a new nest on a plane tree, those trees, in the busy Ramblas of Barcelona. The bird is gathering moss, grass, hair, old feathers, and twigs. Among the brown and green colors of the newly gathered nest, bright pink twigs stand out. The European robin could be among the stakeholders in Pink Mountains, a recent project designed by TAC for the Centro de Arte Santa Monica in Barcelona. It's a space for optimism and refuge in the hard concrete city, a space for reflection and a retreat for both human and non-human species, the robins among them. This acknowledgement of the plurality of life is common in tax practice to carefully craft ecologies that reassess the notion of, shel of shelter, accommodating the needs of multiple species as an effect to the ever-changing conditions around us. TAC is an architecture studio based in Barcelona, founded and led by Mireia Luzarraga and Alejandro Muiño to explore contemporary notions of nature, gender, and politics through their designs. TAC's work belongs to the permanent collection of the FRAC Centre Val de Loire and has been exhibited at the Oslo Triennial and the Venice San Sebastian Tallinn, Maya, and Rabat Biennales, among others. TAC has participated in the exhibitions at Matadero Madrid, Centra de Santa Monica, CCCB, MAC Vienna, TCDC Bangkok, or Alcova Milano. Mireya is currently the Dean's Visiting Assistant Professor at GSAP, Columbia University. She is also professor at the IAC, Institut d'Arquitectura Avançada de Catalunya, and La Salle School of Architecture in Barcelona. Previously, Mireia and Alejandro have participated as professors and lecturers in institutions such as the University of, of Alicante, Petsam, Instituto Europeo de Design, Elisava, RMIT, Floating University in Berlin, and ILEC Stuttgart. Please help me welcome Mireya. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I don't. I think I don't need this. No, I don't need that. No, you don't need it. Thank you very much for the introductions. It's a pleasure to to be here. Uh, the trip was amazing to come from New York to here. I, I, two days before I traveled from Barcelona to New York. Uh, and it's great to see uh, the full house, like uh, so many faces. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. And thank you, Laia, uh, for the introduction, because yeah, uh, we haven't spoke about what this project was about, but Laia made it all, all this story out. Uh, and I'm happy it has a lot to do with the project. And um, we're going to talk about uh, birds and migration and optimism, as Laia was. Uh, saying now, so um, it is like uh, amazing. No? So as Laia also introduced, and I'm not, not going to introduce me anymore, but like we're a, an office of architecture and design based in Barcelona. Uh, and this is a little bit uh, the work that we develop in the office. We, we develop uh, 
lots of projects a year. Uh, what I will do tonight is to show very briefly um, a lot of our projects um, and just like to explain uh, some, some of the things that the, the, uh, the projects have been driven on. Um, uh, so to express, to, to show you a little bit how we work in the studio, how we, uh, yeah, how by producing uh, uh, many projects, you, we get to have this um, agenda. So uh, first project that I, I would like to show you is uh, named uh, ARCA. Um, this, uh, this is a, a drawing that we prepared for the Tallinn um, Biennale. Uh, but uh, ARCA, which is the, the, the drawing on the center, uh, um, with it, we wanted to investigate new models of production of green spaces within the city of Barcelona. Uh, cities usually uh, use the, their plant species uh, using either ornamental or functional criteria. Um, Barcelona is a very dense city, has very little green spaces, not, not like this one, amazing one. And uh, while uh, uh, choosing them with this criteria, uh, we, we have this fragility of the ecosystem, the urban ecosystems, uh, as well as a, a very, an homogenization of the landscapes. No? Um, for example, uh, species that are evergreen are preferred over um, species that their, their leaves would like uh, fall down. No? So because the beauty stays uh, seasonally. No? Or species like that uh, people are, are allergic to, they are like discarded in the city because of like uh, humans' uh, uh, preferences. No? Um, so uh, that is creating a fragility in the ecosystems. No? So our proposal was to build this portable garden that would develop a more complex vision of uh, possibilities of incorporating nature in the contemporary city beyond aesthetic criteria. Um, this um, uh, in collaboration with biologists and landscapers and through the careful selection of plant species, the garden explored the incorporation, for instance, of edible plants that was well, the previous drawing that is shown in the uh, Tallinn Biennale that was about food. So uh, edible plants into the landscape uh, contributing to open debates on our food sovereignty uh, or species capable of absorbing 10, more, 10 times more CO2 than others or uh, species uh, capable of sumoing um, other poll pollinating agents such as uh, bees or butterflies no? by establishing relationships of mutualism and symbiosis with plants. Um, as if it was a procession, the garden could move both mechanically and uh, be taught by citizens themselves, uh, exploring the capacity for celebration and collective gathering around the artifact. No? This was a moment where we were moving um, this uh, device that could move like around the whole city. So uh, the garden, this is the entrance and the back uh, part of the garden, could travel through the streets of the city to those areas where public space is scarcer or go to the areas of greatest uh, uh, pollution almost in real time, or become a classroom, as I mentioned before, for uh, interspecies botanical knowledge for schools in the urban center. So as you see, our projects often have a speculative nature. No? So with the uh, political and uh, material possibilities of the present, they want to imagine alternative scenarios for the future. Um, next project that I wanted to show is the Garden for Romantic Crossovers. Um, this project uh, started with the analysis of the dissident uses that occur in the public space of Madrid, often related to natural spaces, as for example, the cruising. Uh, the practice of having sexual relations between strangers in public spaces, usually understood outside the norm, and uh, that call into question the most common definitions of romantic nature. Um, the Matadero Madrid Cultural Center, this is a, um, a cultural center placed in Madrid uh, that was a, a former uh, place of, of uh, uh, killing pigs for, for, for eating them afterwards. Um, it, it's located on the heart of an uh, urban heat island uh, due to the lack of uh, vegetation and shadow. No? And, and because it is protected, because it is heritage, uh, it is very difficult to act there, no? So, but like, uh, yeah, temperatures there are like uh, 
much higher than uh, than uh, close by. No? So the, the river is over there, almost like a three degrees Celsius, um, higher temperatures than, um, than in uh, the river. No? So uh, what we uh, thought for this uh, cultural center that uh, they proposed us to thought, think of a, a complete um, um, strategic uh, contribution to, the, to this place in order to mitigate the effects of climate change in this heat island. Um, was uh, to implement architectural solutions based on nature and at the same time we think the role uh, of public space from a queer point of view. So uh, what we did, this was a model for the proposal, but then we did a prototype, uh, like a mock-up of all the technologies and, the, uh, and things that we would like to include in this uh, garden for romantic crossovers that we um, showed in the exhibition Ecovisionarios in, in Matadero. So uh, the garden for romantic crossovers links humans, vegetation, and technology in an infrastructural garden of post-natural coexistence that promotes both constructive and environmental strategies that go beyond the traditional discourses associated with ecology. This, so you can see there was this uh, fabric canopy suspended on a lightweight structure of over four meter uh, diameter uh, circular uh, space, uh, shades the hanging of these aphrodisiac and aromatic plant species that will inhabit the garden, creating a naturally controlled scent microclimate protected from cold winter temperatures and excessive heat in the summer, which will facilitate, among others, the relationship between humans and other species, transforming Matadero Madrid into a hub of biodiversity in the city. Uh, so in, uh, here you see a little bit the details of the of the uh, project. So in addition to what was mentioned, a set of UV valves uh, allow us the, the, uh, these blue ones allow us to perceive aspects of the plants that we do not usually see. The thermal lamps, the the red ones, uh, will gently raise the temperature when the inhabitants of the garden need it. And a set of ground pots, as you see there are hanging uh, water tanks uh, um, uh, which no, not only ensure the conditions necessary for food, but would also regulate the humidity of the space to accommodate birds, insects, plants, and humans. Next project uh, is uh, Solstice. Uh, with Solstice, we wanted to explore from which conceptual frameworks we usually formalize architecture putting them in crisis through the adoption of other material and aesthetic um, criteria. Uh, in this case, exploring if we could start from a non-human model to develop a, a small pavilion in this case. So uh, for us, um, this is one of our projects. It was one of our initial projects uh, where we consciously proposed developing the project from the assembly of a multitude of materials from very different origins turning the project from the beginning in an open laboratory for the exploration of new narratives, both technical and aesthetic, something which has become fundamental in our work. So if we agree that the planet is a, a material production as a result of human actions and concepts such as Anthropocene, Capitalocene or Chudlucene, uh, depending how precisely we, we want to refer to the current moment, are a clear example of this, uh, uh, this, this, all these concepts highlight the modern gap that continues to work with binomials such as human, not human, man, woman, object, subject, etc. So in this way, uh, the pavilion is an opportunity to work with shapes and materials that are not usually used in architecture. Flowers, branches, or stones collected in situ share importance with other materials such as plastic, scraps, or uh, or even garbage to configure the space also collected in situ. So uh, a wooden structure assembled uh, by 16 vertical sections and four horizontal se sections uh, milled with a CNC machine supports this six centimeter golden roof and a white foam interior roof that you see here, the white foam interior roof. And uh, as transition elements between the interior and the exterior, there are 16 capitals uh, worked with the origami technique and uh, to protect the interior from the prevailing wind, there is an exterior curtain made of woven nylon threads. 
Next project is uh, in transit, a shelter for migrant species. Um, we, we are all very familiar with the concept of uh, climate refugee, which is this, uh, it is like a new politi political figure um, that uh, it's going to be, get bigger and bigger over the next years, no? So the climate refugee is a person which is forced to migrate from the region of origin due to rapid or long-term changes uh, to their local habitat uh, because of the consequences of climate change, no? Um, so uh, people that are suffering droughts, desertification, rising of sea levels are now forced to migrate, but in the future, uh, they are going to be forced to migrate even more. No? Um, uh, as, as in, for instance, in, in, in this is the case of Spain, the, the certification line is moving to the north. No? In Spain, like it is now around the middle, but like in some years, it's going to go to, go to the north. So, um, but uh, humans, and, and this is what the project is about, are not the only climate migrants. Um, in this project that we called in transit, we wanted to show how the optimal conditions for microorganisms, plants, and other species are also affected by these sudden changes in climate, sharing their zero responsibility for these effects as happened with the majority of human communities that are also affected and forced to migrate. So within the framework of an exhibition where different urban models for the future of Barcelona were discussed, our project arose with the intention of broadening the focus of attention and drawing attention to those silent victims of our industrial development. So uh, what we did uh, was to uh, generate uh, in this uh, room uh, inside uh, uh, the optimum conditions, well, the, the conditions, not the optimum, but the conditions that will be uh, uh, environmental conditions that will be settled in Barcelona in a potential Barcelona of 2075 uh, after the increase of temperatures of, of around like, um, I don't know if I'm going to but in, in uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, uh, by, by the use of the thermal lamps and, uh, and, uh, and humidifiers and so on, we reproduce this climate and then uh, we build this pavilion that was hosting those species that are now not local for Barcelona, but coming from, as you saw on the map, uh, from the north of Africa or from southern Spain, but that will most likely be local in Barcelona at that period because Barcelona will have other temperature conditions. So uh, the proposal arises from considering cities as spaces of interspecies coexistence and therefore taking ecopolitics and environmental ethics as central elements for the construction of a contemporary democracy. Finally, well, I don't know if you listen to the sound, but uh, we also uh, collaborated with a composer to develop systems specific music based on non-human comfort requirements so that the visitor's experience was totally immersive. We learned that, uh, probably know also, no, that plants um, are like uh, vulnerable to sound, no? so they behave uh, uh, differently uh, depending on the sounds that they listen. For instance, in the Netherlands, in the greenhouses, in the uh, very, like, um, um, intense greenhousing, uh, they, they, they play just because that, that stimulates the plants to grow faster, uh, putting them a little bit into stress. What we tried to do with this composer was to uh, compose the sounds that make them be happier and calm and so on. No? So, um, next project uh, is called uh, Dom de Cohabitación. Um, so um, this is the, the, for the first uh, biennial of feminist art and architecture at the Prague uh, Museum in Orléans. The uh, Prague Center is a museum of architecture uh, that ho hosts the third collection of architecture in the world after the MoMA and the Pompidou. And uh, they are based in Orléans, but the, for this biennale, they wanted us to um, 
uh, to um, do something in these headquarters, in these abandoned industrial buildings that is, is supposed to be the new headquarters of the FRAC in some years. No? So, and the starting point was uh, uh, to try to uh, be a starting point for uh, feminist democracy. No? So, uh, but uh, when we what we found out when we came to this industrial space that was also close to other industrial spaces that were already being renovated is that although this, is, this would be the ground zero for the headquarters of the FRAC, uh, it is not a tabula rasa, it is not like a white paper, no? So uh, there were, uh, uh, for us in this, uh, uh, the starting point of the project was to understand that this place uh, was already crossed by a multiplicity of agents before it had ever been, been chosen as a place for its implementation. So insects, plants, soil, and environmental conditions have been established certain relationships already that are worth taking into account when designing any type of architecture that comes next. No? So there was rain inside, there was the soil, there was a lot of vegetation. Uh, and uh, uh, so we wanted to take this into consideration, not come like as uh, traditional architects and like prevent the rain from coming in, uh, um, like uh, flatten the soil and so on. No? So here a little movie, a little bit of, of how uh, uh, we speculated the project to, to work. No? So uh, moving around the space and growing vegetation. No? So uh, as you see, and we, we entitled the proposal for the biennial dome de cohabitación, uh, which means cohabitation dome, um, a mobile infrastructure that floats above the ground intensified those relationships that had already begun to occur in space um, uh, through a whole set of lights, ventilations, and irrigation technologies, typical from the uh, most technological greenhouses, would uh, continue uh, stimulating this relationship and this ecosystem that had already happened there and try to make it grow. No? So what we intended with this project was to explore the imaginaries of a society based on affection, which puts itself in the place of the weak, uh, both human and non-human, based on cooperation instead of competition and on symbiosis instead of extractivism. This was an image of the of the Roman line with the rain that, that still came in the, in the headquarters. Um, the next project is called uh, Cat Shelter. Um, Italy is home to the largest number of species in Europe, but around 70% of its fauna is in danger of extinction due to global warming. And this situation is worsened in urban areas due to the scarcity of green areas, the accumulation of pollutant and the heat island effects. Uh, but Rome has this uh, special and adorable thing, the figure of Gatara. Uh, in Rome, uh, from the times of the empire, um, street cats have been protected by law. Uh, their benefits as pest controllers have survived the modern obsession with sterilizing public spaces reaching the point that uh, they are the only human or not human uh, animals allowed to inhabit the city monuments. So these are the uh, cats, for instance, in Torre Argentina, there is like a, a big um, a colony of cats, no? So uh, by law from the empire, as I said before, uh, if a colony of cats is detected in any corner of the city, if two or more than two cats are detected somewhere in the city, uh, the municipality is forced to protect their habitat wherever they are and to feed them and to uh, make them think, feel comfortable instead of uh, picking them out. I think they are, there are like more than 120,000 cats, uh, street cats in Rome, like more than 60% of the cats are street cats instead of living in, in houses. So, uh, in addition, the cats are helped by uh, these ordinary but organized citizens who, who feed and care of them. They have established this network, network of affection, of care, um, and they are called uh, gataras. So um, after some studies, you see there the, the, the plan of, of Rome. Uh, we were uh, detecting all the uh, different colonies uh, that are cataloged in the city center of Rome. 
uh, we chose that one in Ignacio Silone uh, near Ostia Station, and then there we established our cat shelter. The project speculated on a community for cats uh, through a special and non-anthropocentric uh, architecture. Neither the materials, nor the form, nor the spaces were designed for human use, although they occupied part of the public space. This is the shelter where we were uh, fabricating it at, at the office. Uh, our project uh, investigated this situation um, and pointed to the emergency of thinking about public space, not only prioritizing human needs, but also taking into account other species that inhabit the city and establish with us and other non-humans all kind of mutually beneficial relationships. And this was Alfredo, our neighbor, that was testing the, the shelter uh, all the time and playing with, with the things. No, so uh, with uh, Alfredo, we decided the materials, no, the food that um, that uh, make him feel uh, cozy, the color that he felt attracted to, uh, the chains that he could play with. Um, the food and so on, the ramps, he didn't like them very much, but uh, that uh, was, um, yeah. Um, next project is called Pin Mountains. It's the same project that Laia was uh, uh, um, speculating with before and, and she was not far away from it. Uh, we also were uh, doing uh, another uh, kind of uh, um, research for this project. Mm, and uh, also like opening a kind of a discussion there. No? So uh, the recent history of Spain has a very special relationship with the Argentinian parrot. In the 80s, it became popular as a pet in the Spanish homes. It was very difficult for a boy or a girl not to end up having one of these specimens during their childhood. But as its name indicates, the Argentinian parrot is not originally from Spain, nor even from the Mediterranean coast, but of course from Argentina. So through lots of advertisements due to their striking colors, their affection uh, skills, thousands of these specimens were imported to Spain during the 80s and the 90s. Um, as a consequence of this forced migration and due to the lack of compassion of the owners who ended up abandoning their pets when they got tired of them, the Argentinian parrot has become one of the most numerous plagues and source of social problems in Spain today. So this is a little bit the, how the situation of the parrots is now. They are like, uh, yeah, now like uh, becoming a plague in the cities uh, and uh, being very controversial. No? So um, in the midst of ethical conflicts and discrepancies, between biologists, ecologists, and animal rights defenders, uh, the different governments of the different Spanish capitals, especially in Madrid, um, they are carrying out the extermination of wild population of the Argentinian parrot um, through several methods, uh, including, and this is the most controversial one, uh, hiring hunters who uh, circulate at night and shoot at the, at the parrots. No? Um, the, what we find very interesting because like there's like many of these situations going on many places and now in I don't know if you're familiar in New York there is this lantern flies that everybody is killing also because they come from Asia and uh, they they have they 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 said they 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 are uh, they the people should kill them so the the most curious thing is analyzing the causes of this um so post invasion, but also the reasons for the extermination. No? The, the causes, you know them, no? Like we, we imported them in Spain because we like their colors. So, and then we call them in, in base invaders. So it's like uh, uh, a little bit curious. And then far from the assumptions that we could make about uh, supposed prejudice on native ecosystems, uh, in the case of the Argentinian parrot, there's no, these, the, the experts don't, refer to problems of, uh, of like, yeah, damaging other uh, the, the local ecosystems, but uh, um, the, the, it is restricted to a question of noise. They are very loud and also their nests are very heavy. So uh, uh, this is the, the reason for exterminating them. No? So uh, 
out of this uh, research, we came out with this um, um, pavilion. Uh, the, so in La Ramblas, as, as Elia was saying, La Ramblas is a very touristic place in, in Barcelona. So, and this is the center for at Santa Monica located in La Ramblas, and this is the terrace on top of them. Uh, so like the Argentinian parrot, uh, 15 other species of birds nest around Las Ramblas, um, where 200,000 people circulate every summer day. Um, in this case, they asked us for the construction of a climate shelter in, in this uh, area of Barcelona, in the center of arts, uh, because summer in Barcelona is like a very hard uh, period of time. So they wanted us to try to use these terras and try to give some shadow to these terras. And also the director wanted very much because La Ramblas is this super touristic space that is very much based on consumption. So it's not that much a public space because you, you cannot walk there if you don't con consume or you don't uh, pay. So um, uh, he wanted us to build this, this climate shelter uh, free for uh, anyone that would like to come in. Uh, but uh, we proposed, in addition to that, a project where coexistence with birds, including the Argentinian parrot, uh, would be one of its most characteristic elements. So uh, to, uh, we, we installed in the coronation this uh, huge um, uh, bird houses, uh, but um, what we really, uh, the, the real aim of the, of the installation was the, that we installed also this uh, uh, pink uh, painted, uh, artificially pink painted uh, little branches as a covering materials. Uh, so to try to collaborate with the birds of La Ramblas and give them like building elements to build their nests. No? So we were like uh, dreaming that, uh, it in a, uh, to see around Las Ramblas all these birds uh, picking up their branches in order to have this set of queer nests around the uh, city of uh, Barcelona and around Las Ramblas. Um, the, uh, in the interior, uh, we also installed this central garden that would also um, uh, contribute to reduce the temperatures through a humidity exchange. exchange and this uh, perimetral bench uh, would invite you to uh, sit. Uh, no? And of course, uh, because the terrace is not on the ground floor, uh, we need to be uh, very like, uh, uh, to have a, a, a little bit of impact for, from La Rambla so that people uh, would have the uh, intention to join this like uh, climate shelter. Okay, so this, uh, this block of projects that I have just shown you, uh, are uh, projects that we usually develop either as you saw in a public space uh, or in the or for cultural institutions and um, always like trying to uh, as, as I said on the first project with the material and, polit uh, and political possibilities of the present try to envision possible futures related to other species uh, also always having in mind uh, climate change uh, now we're like I'm going to show you a couple of uh, other projects uh, of, of two uh, projects um, that have like a complete uh, different uh, program. Uh, well, we've entitled it uh, "Domesticities in the New Global Climate Regime" um, because they are uh, uh, domestic uh, uh, spaces. So. Um, uh, these are uh, two recent projects uh, with a, a very uh, radically uh, program from the ones that you saw before. No? Uh, first of all uh, is the day after house. Um, um, like uh, we, uh, um, I'm not gonna get in depth because it is, this is usually one, a lecture of one hour that we usually do, but uh, um, uh, we would also want to explain you how we um, uh, approach the situation of uh, having like a complete different uh, commission and how uh, would we deal with a domestic space, uh, which is like, yeah, something like uh, more.
more like to to live in the present, more like uh, less ephemeral and so on. No, uh, but like uh, with these uh, uh, reference images that may I may come a little bit later, uh, what we did was to analyze the history of each of the types of spaces and functional organization of a current prototypical middle class home in the West. No. Uh, we tried to find out at what time and in what way the different parts of the house had, had crystallized into the form and materiality it has today. No? Uh, more or less, the houses where you live in and the houses where I live in uh, in Western culture are more or less organized the same, like uh, um, uh, smaller or bigger, but uh, the same. No? So we went through the whole history of like, uh, of the kitchens, of the bathrooms, of the hallways, uh, etc., in order to understand the political reasons that had led to that configuration, and from in, from then on, try to dismantle them if necessary. No, so you can see there, for instance, uh, first slide is the, is uh, uh, a Swiss stove. No, so we were very much reflecting on how there was some point of the history where we uh, included, where we uh, uh, started heating and cooling our spaces with, based on fossil fuels. Uh, but before that, we were reviewing the history of passive and active ways of heating and cooling uh, houses uh, other than based on fossil fuel energies. No? So that is something that, that we, um, uh, that we think we have to rethink and we have to revisit, especially in these times where the uh, crisis of, uh, of oil is going to, uh, we're, we're running out of these resources, no? Uh, next one, the, the I don't know. No. Uh, uh, next one is this like um, uh, bath uh, moment, no? Um, where we notice like how uh, uh, little by little, like uh, like how our baths are uh, starting to uh, be on the on the most uh, and the darkest and less ventilated parts of the homes, and usually they are smaller. And uh, we uh, we read and we uh, and we noticed how they had evolved also in history, and. Uh, it is like uh, very much also related to our uh, Catholic or Christian uh, uh, culture that uh, yeah, flesh is uh, seen and we like no and, and we more and more like we do these kind of things on the darkest places of the house no and then this other one is we were reflecting also on ornament no? on uh, how uh, modernism has banned uh, ornament no and what are the reasons who that led us to that, no? and um, who uh, were the uh, who was there when uh, when uh, modernist modernism started, uh, and who was not there represented, no? and how yeah uh, sometimes the yeah, minor um, works uh, were works like that were traditionally assigned to women, or how uh, yeah all these like. Uh, uh, manifestos were very much uh, um, strengthening the power of some uh, collectivities and uh, weaknessing the rest. No? Or we went also through the kitchens uh, and we came out with the Frankfurt kitchen, which is the, uh, uh, we, uh, it, it is from the, um, a century ago, 1922, I think. Uh, and it, it, it was a revolution, no? Because it's like a, a kitchen, no? It, 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 may, it, it, was a, it was a very functional kitchen. It was like a, 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 an incredible revolution, but uh, that was like a century ago, no? And it, like, it looks like our kitchens today are very similar to the Frankfurt kitchen, no? So, of course, like, uh, maybe our kitchen is not like as revolutionary as Frankfurt kitchen, but at least I, we think we have to keep on like, uh, uh, thinking of if society have changed, why our spaces are still the same, no? Or uh, this other one, this um, green one is the Swiss, uh, the um, uh, uh, coal stove in, in Lisbon, no? How also 
with the help of other species, with the, the help of vegetation, and not always relying all, uh, everything to fossil fuels, we can also like uh, um, uh, control our temperatures, no? or cool or, or make higher temperatures. No? Or also this kind of images no? of the, in this case, the, the birth of uh, Jesus, no? on how uh, uh, also before modernism, uh, our relationships with um, other species um, were many times uh, mutualistic. No? When you having a relationship with other species, uh, it can be, um, it can cause a negative, negative effect. No? When you uh, uh, two predators competing, both of them are going to lose. No? Uh, other ones are positive, neutral, like for instance, a parasite is like feeding, uh, uh, getting food, but you are getting, uh, or no, positive, negative, no? Others are uh, neutral, neutral, positive, many things, no? But uh, some of them are positive, positive, no? They, they are called the mutualistic relationships, no? So uh, in this case, these, these, these two animals that were there, were there because of thermal purposes, no? So, uh, yeah, this this issue about like how why are like our modernist uh, uh, houses are usually super isolated from the environment and that also creates unhealthier uh, environments and uh, and why don't we uh, bring back relationships with other um, species no or uh, these images of the garages of Silicon Valley no they also uh, thinking on these spaces that have um, not very much like um, they are like very neutral. Like they have like no program assigned. They are spaces that uh, uh, you don't, you cannot tell if this is a garage or or somewhere where so a band is playing or or something else. We were also very attracted to them. And last one is the 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 block where we were doing this renovation. No? So we we took this time to okay. Once that we have a program, because sometimes the pavilions, the, all the previous projects that you saw uh, are very much uh, on, um, uh, we apply our research that you have been doing, but once that we have a program, we start to uh, looking into the, uh, the history of, of or, and to a, a little bit, I'm trying to uh, unveil why we are living as we live, no? So, um, I will go a little bit, I will uh, explain you a little bit everything that uh, we did in the house, but I will go uh, deeply into, more deeply into one of them, for instance. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the study on, uh, on uh, bedrooms, no? on how bedrooms have become what they are now. No? So uh, uh, the bedrooms that every one of us have at our homes. No? Um, so uh, we analyzed this, uh, the, like our heritage of the bourgeois house where we all live, uh, that has this um, habit of organizing the house into rooms and sleeping separately. No? So we came to study uh, Silvia Federici um, and her materialist and feminist analysis of the birth of capitalism in the 15th century. Uh, and we learned that gradually during that period, rooms began to become smaller and smaller and specialized uh, spaces exclusively for sleeping. And why she, she says that is to, um, uh, uh, um, and, uh, and they also like started to increase depending on the inhabitants of the house, no? in order to each inhabitant has an individual bedroom. No? So, what uh, Silvia Federici reflects on this is that um, uh, incipient cap capitalism increasingly needs stronger and more differentiated subjectivities that can better adapt to the multitude of offers that the new industrial processes uh, can offer also. No? So uh, on, on the other hand, uh, the, the, the loss of advantages that sleeping together has uh, such from a, from a both from a climatic point of view and uh, from an affective point of view, they again offer the market the possibility of devising new solutions that satisfy these losses 
basically the introduction of fossil energy in our homes. So, uh, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. If, if, if we look at this um, engraving of, uh, of the 16th century of uh, Giovanni Stradano, um, we see uh, the way of inhabiting the rooms in that period that is very different from the current one. No? So what you see is what they call an alcove, like a, a, a lot, a, a, it's like a room uh, with a multiplicity of, uh, of furnitures where uh, people are doing like uh, several things. No? The, from sleeping, we can tell that the, this is a bed, uh, someone is going to sleep there, to working, to gathering, to uh, preparing food and so on. No? So, um, uh, so that was what they looked like before, uh, and then they came on into this, no? So uh, you see there at the left, uh, the original um, version of the house, and then at the right, you see the, the, the renovated house, no? So first you see uh, that there is this, um, uh, no? The, it, it is like a configuration based on corridors and bedrooms. It, it, similar to every house where we live in. And uh, the spaces have no ventilation, no cross ventilation, no? E every space has a ventilation, but not cross ventilation. Of course, the bathrooms are, have no ventilation, have no, no natural light, are small and full of, of many things. And of course you have like a, an entrance for the service and a main entrance, uh, so that the, the cleaning lady uh, doesn't have to see the visitors and so on. No? So uh, this was what we find out and, and this is where we get. No? So um, while this uh, regular home is having a distribution through corridors that gives access to um, different rooms, um, uh, the project opted for an organization um, through nested spaces Species, spaces that retain the heat in the central part of the house where it was the only room in the house. Uh, we wanted this uh, house not to depend on fossil fuel energies. So uh, what we did, uh, as you see more in this drawing, is that uh, the house uh, in this blue part, we left, we left it like exterior. We took away the windows and we call it the summer house because it's somewhere where that is like having a very, uh, soft uh, temperature during summer. And then we built a, a house, a, a box, which we call the uh, winter house that is super uh, well insulated. And then uh, still a, a, a more interior box uh, that it has more insulation and that uh, can generate like uh, more, uh, can be warmer. Um, so to be the bedroom. No? So uh, with the help of this configuration of space, of nested um, spaces and uh, the um, and and the, the the human uh, heat because we are like uh, also like stoves we are emitting heat all the time we could uh, nest these programs uh, in in the different uh, temperature requirements. No? So uh, the advantages of sleeping together are uh, innumerable, both for climate and energy saving reasons and to strengthen uh, emotional ties. So the project chooses to build, uh, of course, the client wa agreed with it, <laughs> wanted it, to build a single uh, communal bedroom, regardless of the number of inhabitants of the house. A large, long and spatially complex bedroom that incorporates different strata allows different forms of relationship between the inhabitants. This is the bedroom. Um, so uh, you also can see uh, in here, the, what we call the winter house. So uh, with the effort on, we uh, were working with very uh, low um, uh, carbon embedded um, materials such as wood and cork that uh, would have uh, a lot of inertia in order, not to, in order to keep the heat inside of the house. So uh, in winter, we, we, we wouldn't need uh, fossil fuels to heat up our house. It is like uh, naturally um, uh, heated. 
Um, and this was the winter house and the communal bedroom. But uh, in the summer house, we left, like we took away the windows, we left the space um, as it was. Also, like as a statement, we decided to just build over 50% of the house because the other, the, 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 the summer house, we decided not to build on top of them. Like that, we save 50% of the budget, but like that, we also save 50% of the emissions, no? Uh, best way to be ecologic is not to, not to build, no? So uh, we also included uh, this uh, vegetation in this summer house, so to also during summer, the temperatures would be lower. And uh, here you can see, uh, for instance, uh, from the entrance, you can see like, because the room is elevated, you can see the, the kitchen. Uh, we also like uh, the, the um, uh, bedroom, we added this uh, ornament, uh, uh, these stones that, that were also working uh, as uh, counterweights. And uh, for instance, um, one thing was the, uh, what we reflected about the kitchen, uh, because as you saw the other, uh, the previous uh, configuration of the house had the winter, the kitchen uh, was just accessible for the, um, for the uh, cleaning lady or for the, uh, it was not accessible to everyone. So what we thought was we will introduce the kitchen on the um, very central part of the house you can see it from everywhere in the house. So to invite people, regardless of their gender, to take part on the kitchen. And more than that, we try to, instead of like uh, traditionally uh, kitchens, we have it at this uh, height, 90 centimeters. So to be uh, uh, comfortable while uh, uh, cooking. But in this case, this kitchen would uh, become a, a dining table as, as you've seen here, no? Uh, as you've seen here, or a table for uh, a desk or a table for playing and so on, uh, so that it became even like more uh, incorporated in the uh, um, day life of the house. And of course, all those items that need to be for uh, functional uh, reasons, uh, higher uh, for, for cooking and preparing meal and so on, would be lifted uh, with these legs, no? And uh, for the uh, bathroom, uh, we also were uh, um, placing the bathrooms in the most privileged places of the house with the natural light and ventilation and so on, and also trying to propose other uh, kinds of relationships that we have with uh, having a bath or, um, or uh, going to the, to, to the bathroom, yeah. And uh, last project uh, that I, uh, very, very quickly that I wanted to show you, because I'm already almost out of time, uh, is the 10K house. Uh, this project is again a domestic uh, space, very much to have to, has to do with the previous one. But uh, in, this, uh, in this case, we added another layer. Um, uh, so, uh, the thing is that, that we wanted to include the economic factor in the ecological issue. So uh, usually making an ecological design costs more money than one that is not, no? So an electric car more costs more than another car. So a photovoltaic cells cost more than, no? So uh, we, uh, the market favors any type of solution based on the fossil uh, industry over a sustainable one. So in this project, uh, we wanted to see to what extent we could work by reducing the budget and also dismantle the models and aesthetics supposedly associated with homes of lower economic value. 10K house, it's because the, the renovation was 10K euros. So it's like quite like super, super cheap. So first thing that we did was, okay, how are we going? to uh, subject the materials used in the day after house, in the house that I showed you before, to an economic analysis based on three parameters. Um, incorporated carbon, economy, and aesthetic importance. No? So all these uh, uh, elements, the walls, the building, the electric installation, water installation, all of those, we uh, try to um, compare the, uh, them like uh, in these parameters and uh, either, keep them for the other renovation or try to find 
uh, and other more economic solutions that would also be low carbon embedded and also uh, uh, performing uh, aesthetically. No? So out of that, our conclusions was this uh, 10K manifesto that I, I will explain you with photos. Uh, so again, uh, of course, this house was much smaller, but again, we were working with thermal regions in order not to depend on fossil fuels, to heat or cool the house. In this case, the house is in Barcelona. The weather is a little bit uh, uh, easier in Barcelona not to heat and, and cool um, artificially. So, but we also work with these thermal gradients. Second point of the uh, manifesto is the elevation of the built elements of the house, allowing like that the free passage of installations of water and electricity without the need to make holes uh, or grooves on the wall, like that reducing the number of industrial experts that we, we have to call. No? Um, Third one is the reduction of the material palette to the maximum. So to keep the parameters of cost, energy efficient and structural performance as balanced as possible. So we mainly work with MDF, which is uh, super like, uh, of course, yeah, the other house was worked with pine wood, which is like um, nicer, uh, but uh, it is like three times um, more expensive than the MDF. So in this case, we decided to work with MDF and uh, wool. Uh, I will go over the, go through the wool afterwards. Uh, then the elimination of new coatings, saving both in the purchase of new materials and in the execution times. No? So we decided uh, not to paint the walls. Um, uh, that is something that the client can do any other time, but uh, saving money for uh, other things that we thought were uh, more important and then uh, paintings, uh, he can do it. And of course, uh, the floor, we kept the floor as it was, uh, but then in some places that we, uh, that uh, was not possible because there was uh, previously a wall or there was uh, uh, the kitchen floor and so on, we added some concrete also being like that, uh, uh, ecological, no? not, not to uh, um, throwing away these kinds of materials. No? Another one that you can also see, it is a direct heritage of the previous house, is the hedonistic and playful visions of the bathroom and kitchen spaces uh, that come to occupy the best parts of the house near to the facades. No? So you replace the bath and the, and the kitchen there. And uh, most important one is the self-construction. So this renovation was exclusively made of out of dry assembly work. Uh, so like that, we could uh, generate a set of like, uh, we, we started with a CNC from the plants to the CNC to assembling both us, us together with the client. Um, and, uh, and that was the manifesto. And I was just wanting to point out one thing. Uh, that we found uh, super satisfying was the work with wool. As you said, this is the bedroom where that is having a little bit more of insulation that is made out of wool. Uh, it is a, 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 a thermal insulation that is coming from the transhuman ship of the Pyrenees. It's the ship that are moving around Spain uh, and they, they do a, a big labor on um, uh, uh, conserving, preserving the ecosystems and uh, balancing the ecosystems. But because they are traveling so much and, and uh, the wool gets dirty, this wool is not, um, it's not suitable for the uh, textile industry, so it's usually wasted. Uh, but there are several cooperatives in, in Catalonia that they are recovering this wool in order to make thermal insulations that are usually hidden but uh, we really wanted to keep it uh, a scene, so also to like um, be able to see and sense and talk about these uh, uh, kinds of uh, networks of, of uh, uh, relationships that can happen out of materialities. No? Um, so uh, yeah, last, uh, I would like to end up with this quote from Paul Preciado who reading Derrida alert us to the delusion behind apparently sacred concepts such as nature, and they give us clues on how to act to dismantle it. 
Uh, so Paul Preciado says the success of the performative does not depend on a transcendent power of language, but on the simple repetition of a social ritual that legitimizes it by, by, his, by power, hides its historicity. Thank you very much. I think this was really inspiring for the students. We're going to, I would like to ask you a question before we open up okay. to the public. So the last project, the ah. 10K house, you mentioned that it was self-constructed by the client. Yeah. What's the process in the other projects, in the smaller ones? Like, what's the setup in your studio? <laughs> oh, well, I have it here. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, uh, we usually yeah, get the commissions from the clients. We, uh, we are like uh, four people at the office now. So we start doing uh, uh, brainstorming. We have also like many, uh, research is going on so we try to okay let's maybe if it fits or not and 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 then we do the design and it's usually um we uh control very much all the process from the from the beginning to the, like so the the uh this uh issue of the self-construction of the 10k house uh, it is like that every time more or less like uh except for the day after house it was uh done uh, with external people but the uh, mostly yeah many of all of the projects are done in the office like uh pro, pro, people are kind of experts on on carpentry and so on but uh, yeah sometimes we are like very much amateurs trying to assemble different kinds of materials and so on and that allows us to because it is close to us it is in the office even we live in the office so it's like we have it always there uh, to yeah to to use the projects also very much as laboratory of how we can assemble things or how, what materials could be suitable for construction uh, we use many construction materials but we use many other kinds of materials and i think that is something that is very particular from the office that that uh, allows us to test and to uh, yeah to change of mind and so on yeah mm. Are there questions? Hi, uh, my Hello. name is Matthew. I'm a third year bachelor's of architecture student. I found your presentation very interesting, especially your unique approach to how you consider the environment and the ecosystem. Um, to me, the general approach to that is, is an approach of sustainability <coughs> where conservation and preservation of resources are the focus or you take a, your projects take a very active role in participating in the climate and ecosystem and so a lot of times as our <coughs> asking ourselves what resources the environment is creating for us so we can build our architecture so my question for you is what can our architecture do to give back to the environment well super smart eh, that question <laughs> Um, so first, first thing that you pointed out, I think it's like uh, super smart because um, it is a little bit what we are trying to uh, like. Uh, what is our agenda? The, and because sometimes I be, I say the technical words that maybe you are not used to it because you are undergraduate and so on. Uh, you you nailed it. Like. Uh, Usually, we are talking very much about uh, ecology from the point of view of sustainability. In but we all have take have bought the concept of sustainability uh, uh, just um, from a very technical point of view. No, so uh, meaning that all these certificates of uh, the green buildings or the lead buildings and so on, just taking into consideration. Um, 
some uh, parts of, the, of, of, of some technical issues about the things. No? So if the material uh, has been um, produced with a lot of fossil fuels or not, no? or if the material uh, can be uh, re, re, uh, can le, no? if, it, if it's a tree, no? it can be regenerated some days uh, years afterwards, or if this material has uh, no. So we just take this. Uh, uh, technical uh, factor, no? So, for instance, I just uh, to put an example, no? So the uh, there is this. I don't know if you're familiar with it. This uh, Mazdar City by uh, Norman Foster is like a, a city that has won all these kind of certificates, no? Um, but for instance, uh, but of course they use all the materials that have the best checks and so on, but in order, but also because they needed to fill all these requirements of these certifications, like uh, the lead certificate, uh, they needed to accomplish the works in a certain amount of time, and otherwise they won't be sustainable. That makes sense because the more time you are working, the, the more pollution. pollution no? But what happened is because there, were, there was Ramadan at that period, uh, they had to have the people working for 20 hours a day with no eating and so on. No? So is that sustainability? Uh, probably not. No? So what we think uh, uh, is that uh, uh, ecology is not just this question. No? It's and, and what we also, with the last sentence that, that we said is that um, also, uh, and when I talked about the Anthropocene and so on, uh, Nature is not just that thing that is separated from culture and that we have to protect and that it's just a background that you just grow some trees and you, that is okay. But nature is something that it doesn't exist anymore because this concept of Anthropocene means that for, um, we are in this geological era where uh, people are, we are actively uh, changing the metabolism of Earth. So, nature doesn't exist anymore because every piece of nature is affected by us. Like even in the Galapagos, like in the more remote uh, places in the world, it is, no? So if we are using it just as a background, um, uh, instead of an active uh, other material that we can use, um, uh, we think that it, that is not the way because that is going to lead you to this kind of, um, uh, practices like I told you in Mazdar, or um, many, uh, the, the fact of treating nature like that um, has many times, and that is the last sentence that I was um, um, reading about uh, Paul Preciado, is that uh, many times uh, we justify uh, no, uh, things uh, with nature that uh, we are also over them. No? So the fact, for instance, that we justify that uh, what is natural is uh, a relationship between a man and a woman. No? So and that is not true. That we, we all know that, no? but that has been, no, and uh, we have been historically made all many kinds of uh, um, affirmations like that, that we think we, ha it's, uh, we, we have to uh, be over them. No? So, um, uh, what can we do? Uh, I think that was your question. Sorry. Uh, I think first of all, we I think we have to think like that, no? And 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 then of course I think we have to. Um, another thing that we think is that um, we have to start doing something collectively, uh, so to stop this uh, issue, no? And stop like for instance. Uh, uh, dividing the responsibility into all of us, no? So to um, uh, uh, just to, uh, I, we think it's just our individual actions as individuals. I'm, I'm traveling in bike, I'm not, I'm recycling and so on. It is not enough and it is also hiding the situation that like, uh, many other bad things are done other than our individual actions, no? So I think, yeah, we have to start to operate uh, collectively uh, now. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you for your interesting presentation. I had Thank like you. two questions. It's, it's not like in the detail, it's not like the last question, but I'm always curious like about like the clients that you had, like with like, you know, for those two last projects, like, cause for us as designers, we are always like, oh, we have some ideas. We're gonna like, you know, work on them. We're gonna build them or do, like, but like, how much freedom did you have like doing, doing those two projects? And like, what's going on now after like the, the project is done? And who hmm. are the clients? Like, how did they approach these like, your ideas? And like, how did they accept your ideas? Because somebody who is like, I don't know, not in the field of design might not be open as, for, as open as us, like these ideas. Hmm. So how that affected your process of designing and like you know, making a project? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That is, yeah. Uh, yeah, for the first set of projects, I think we, we, we have been super lucky because uh, if many people tell us, no, like it's, it's not, it's impossible to have such good clients, but it's, it's like that. Uh, the thing is, I think, um, because I think we started many times like uh, doing our own projects and building our own things and so on. So uh, for instance, the project of Solstice, like the, the Golden Dome was uh, done by us, for us, because we were trying to like do things. So I think after that, cl clients come to us because of the things that we do. So they are like trusting a lot. No? And it's also uh, for um, Vienna, so clients that they usually in the cultural uh, environment, they usually uh, are more open and they, they, they really like give us a lot of freedom. Uh, for the clients of the houses, it's like, so they, uh, it is like uh, much more difficult because it's like even like many people that are architects uh, say that, okay, it's like problematic to have a communal bedroom, it's problematic, many things, no? Um, uh, first client that, that we had on the day after house, it's like, a, a, it's a very close client. So it was very easy. It, it, it's my brother. <laughs> so he has a baby. He wants to raise her uh, like that. He, my my sister-in-law is working for the NATO. So it's like, um, it was very easy with them. And then second one, they, he came because of the first one, no? So he's like super committed to that, no? And, and it was, we were lucky, no? Because like you saw the kitchen, no? The 10 cake house is like nothing, no? But he's like a, a vegan, just eating peanuts, no? So it's like, it was so easy and he's preserving the house. And we were like, okay, we're leaving, now paint it because it's going to be dust there. No, no, he wants it like that. He loves it like that. So we are very lucky. It's true that, uh, that uh, we have had also clients that ask us for a home and we, we, have, uh, we don't want to, we want to do this or more radical than this, no? So if they ask us for things that we don't like, although they, that we don't believe that they are like, you know, like uh, we have this experience of one client, uh, we didn't like the approach to some things. Uh, we say, we tell him, we, I, we like you very much, we love you very much. We know great architects that will do a great work for you, but uh, we are not going to do it, no? So, yeah. It's, it's kind of coming from the safe space of architect, right? Because like, you're like, oh, I don't like the project. I don't like the origin for the project, so I'm not going to work with you. But like for an architect who needs projects, right? Or who yeah. wants to work with somebody who is like a normal person, like she wants like a house. So it, there's it, like yeah. a divide, or I don't know, like yeah. there's a gap. Yeah, yeah. The, what I think is we are very lucky. Like we are like, and we, and we, and we love the fact that other architects are doing great, archi great things and so on. But we, we now uh, don't need it. Not many, maybe tomorrow uh, we need to do it, no? But now we, we have other things and we like, and we also struggle a lot to be like this, like, no, like we lost a lot of, uh, no, we also like, uh, we, we lost money by doing this, no? So uh, nowadays we prefer doing it like this, but yeah, maybe tomorrow. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. We know the best uh, deal with the environment, the vernacular architecture. Yeah. Yeah. Is that true? Uh, my take, that's my take. You inspired by the vernacular architecture, uh, use of materials, and thinking about the inside and outside uh, yeah. spaces or not. Yeah, we think it's crucial to, uh, we, we don't like to say like, we just have to come to the past and be very romantic about the past was always better. But it's true that whenever, like, like there was this moment, uh, the modernist moment where we forgot all this knowledge of vernacular architecture that was good for the soil, for other species, for the health, for the weather for everything because we relied on fossil fuels, no? So for instance, this renovation, the, the day after house comes from a block of apartments that it's like a four symmetries, no? Like a symmetry and a symmetry. So the same, you have the same uh, dwelling and the symmetry of the same dwelling. So you have one living room to the north, one living room to the south, regardless of the orientation. Like, so it's something that we truly forgot, like, you know, uh, the, the, sun comes from the east out and goes up to the west so why don't you um like why don't you design accordingly no and uh, the soil and everything like we you know and uh, we 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 really look at it very much no for the active past, uh, ways of heating uh, the passive ways of heating the fact of using for instance um, at my partner's place um, in galicia in the north of spain they were using like the, the, there was on the ground floor, they, host, they had the cows. Then they had the floor, which was porous. So the heat of the cows would heat the living room. No? So establishing relationships with other species by just like not doing so close to the architecture. No? So for us, it's very important. There was this, uh, and now in the Venice Biennale, there is this uh, Slovenian pavilion that it's just about vernacular examples and uh, they invited like 40 architects. Each of them is like um, bringing a vernacular example of, of uh, passive uh, ways of heating or cooling. And we were contributing there. So yeah, we think it's very important, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. We'll continue. We'll follow your work.